Appreciate everybody coming out. Um, obviously, I'd like to start with a with a statement. You know, I think you guys all know. Yesterday, uh, Penn State Health uh, issued a statement uh, rejecting Dr. Lynch's claims. Uh, we'll continue to vigorously defend our program and all its participants in this manner. As always, the health and well-being of our student athletes is of utmost importance to us. Um, but after that, you know, we'll, we'll have no further comments. So I just wanted to make sure we covered that. On uh, positive news, on positive news, uh, academically, I don't know if you guys saw, we put out yesterday, very proud of what our guys accomplished this summer. Um, and we're talking about, you know, some guys that took up to, uh, I think, 21 credits uh, in the summer, a couple guys with 18 credits, very similar to what Saquon did a couple summers ago. Uh, but with that, we had 32 guys earn uh, from a 3.0 to a 3.49, 17 guys that earned a 3.5 to a 3.99, and then 11 guys that earned a 4.0 for summer school. So really proud uh, of how our guys are handling on their business which is awesome obviously getting into the Idaho game we've never played Idaho before you know there's not too many things you know when you talk about 2019 that you can say from a football perspective that's never happened before so uh, playing Idaho for the first time uh, coach Petrino I think everybody is familiar with coach Petrino his family he's got a football family uh, very well respected in his seventh season uh, was conference coach of the year a few years back they returned 14 starters. Um, I won't get into a whole lot of the stuff that you guys are already aware of, uh, but Coach Sinkovich, the offensive coordinator, he's been the offensive coordinator all seven years there. Uh, if you look in 2016, they had a phenomenal year offensively, really across the board. Uh, spread offense scheme, uh, but they will go 11 personnel, 10 personnel, 12, and then you'll also see they'll bring an extra tackle in on short yards and go some 22T personnel. Uh, you know, their schemes that they love to do is split flow zone that everybody seems to be running now, the old school power G, zone read, stretch weak. Um, and then obviously impressed with their quarterback, Mason Petrino, um, wide receiver Jeff Cotton, and then wide receiver Cutrell Haywood. Uh, defensively, Coach Bresky, uh, fifth year as a defense coordinator, Idaho, 39 years of coaching experience, has been a defensive coordinator for a very, very long time. Uh, they're a base front 4-2. They'll mix in some three down stuff on third down. Primary coverage, you're talking about some type of quarters, cover four. Uh, they will mix in some fire zone 33 or, or, or cover one. Um, guys that we're impressed with is, is their defensive tackle, um, you know, number 55, Rash Rashawn Crawford. If I've read this correctly, uh, 5 10, 297 last year, but I think he's like 330 pounds right now is what I saw most recently listed. Uh, strong safety number 25, Jalen Hoover, and then also cornerback number 5, Lloyd Hightower. And then on special teams, uh, Adam Bresky, uh, in his first season as a special teams coordinator there, impressed with their, something you don't see very often anymore is, is Cade Coffey handles both their kicking and punting duties, uh, really does it all. You don't see that very often anymore. So uh, looking forward to that opportunity. We've had a great camp. We're as healthy as we have been um, in a training camp, after a training camp in a long time. A lot of the sports science adjustments we've made um, after gaining all this information over the last couple of years has, has been really valuable. Um, so, you know, we're in a good place. You know, this is going to be obviously an important week of prep for us and then go out and play well on Saturday and, and build confidence. So, um, you know, excited about the opportunity, excited about Idaho coming in here. I think you guys know I got some history with that part of the country. Uh, I was a GA at Washington State. Uh, my wife uh, went to Washington State. Um, what I'm, what I'm, was told, you know, is my time out there is when Washington State and Idaho used to play the, against each other. Uh, years ago, the loser would have to walk back to the other campus. They're only about seven miles apart. Um, so um, excited about the opportunity, excited about the game, and, and open up the questions. We'll start with Rich Scarcella from the Reading Eagle. Good afternoon, James. Hey, Rich. What was the deciding factor or factors in naming Sean Clifford, Clifford the starter, and how did Will Levis handle the decision? 
Yeah, you know, Will handles everything extremely well. Mom and dad uh, were, were really good about it, too. I mean, obviously disappointing. You want to be the starting quarterback. I get that, but but handled it extremely well. I, I think it really, you know, comes down to, you know, um, a lot of things. I think, you know, obviously, consistency, you know, for us, uh, very similar to when we named, you know, Trace the starting quarterback, the experience factored in. Uh, you got an older guy. Uh, who played in games um, and and really had you know competed like crazy and and done everything that you know he needed to do from the time the season ended, uh, but Will did as well you know and and we think his Will's very very talented and got a very very bright future but I think you know when it's close like that you're always going to go with the the older more experienced player um, and that's you know that's really what what Sean is um, and uh, and has done a great job so you know he's both of those guys have earned um, all the the coaches respect um, obviously he's also earned all the all the the players respect and then obviously you see Sean uh, was also voted as a captain so so all those things kind of factor into it Derek Lavar Spoke Spare Times leader Hi, James. How are you? Good, Derek. How are you? Good. Just sort of building off that, James, as a coach, how do you handle the aftermath of a quarterback decision? You talked about Will handled it pretty well, but, you know, we're seeing across the country QBs looking to transfer, you know, less than 24 hours after teams name a starter. So how did you approach that with Will, and was your approach any different now maybe than it was even three years ago with, uh, with Trace and Tommy? No, uh, really no different, you know, where we are probably different at the quarterback position than we are at other positions um, is we'll bring those guys into my office. So me and the offensive coordinator will bring them in, tell them the decision that's been made, why the decision has been made. That's how I've done it for, for nine years. Um, um, you know, and see if there's any questions. Um, and then and then kind of keep it moving. And then we ask, we usually, you know, tell the one guy and then we ask him to keep it quiet because we don't want guys to hear hear about it before we've had a chance to talk to them. And based on academic schedules and things like that, sometimes you can't meet with them right after one another. So uh, meet with both of them and then, um, you know, and then obviously, you know, I'll let the team know because same thing, I really don't like the team um, as a whole or players individually to find out things, um, you know, online, you know, through the media, through social media, whatever it is, before they've heard it from us. So we try to kind of have that process that the family, you know, hears these decisions first uh, before it's announced publicly. So, you know, that, that's, that's how we've handled it. We've handled it that way for nine years. Uh, for the most part, it's it's uh, again, it's never an easy conversation to have, and there's disappointment. But uh, for the most part, it's it's gone it's gone uh, as, as well as 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 you could expect. Mark Wilgenrich, Allentown Morning Call. James, how are you? Hey, Mark. Two points that your defensive players made in the off season regarded um, finishing games, closing games, and getting turnovers, especially fumbles. So, what new ways did you address those two elements during training camp? Could I get a in-house media translation? Okay. Sorry, it was uh, you were breaking up there. It was so hard to hear you. Um, yeah, I, I think you know. For us, you know, I think your point was uh, about finishing games and 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 closing people out. Um, I think I think the first thing is obviously uh, playing well enough for four quarters that 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 you know we don't play as many close games. I think I think that's the first thing. And then the second thing is obviously making sure that we are prepared um, both mentally and physically to handle situational football and understand how we're going to play those things and our philosophy in all three phases and then obviously build the confidence up that when uh, those moments come that that we're all confident to make the play when the play comes and that's that's coaches that's players that's that's all of us um, so that's you know that's what we spent all camp working on and, and talking about and um, you know I, I think you know, those games the other night, the first games of the season, I think were really valuable. Our players all watch them, and then we come in the next day and um, kind of go through them. You know, what, what are common mistakes that show up in early games like that, that, um, you know, we have a process in place that hopefully eliminates, you know, some of those things. And then some positives. You know, you look at that Arizona-Hawaii game, that defensive tackles play late in the game was a great example of, 
you can have a pretty darn good career um, off of effort and hustle and mentality. You know, what a, what a big time play that is. If the D tackle doesn't get involved, you know, that guy may fall in that end zone and, and goes to overtime. So you know, we try to take those games and and break them down and cut them up and have discussions with the team about them. Um, no different than we do with our coaching careers that hopefully the players can learn from experiences that we've had over 25 years or 30 years or whatever it may be. Um, so, um, you know, I think it's been good. Frank Bodani, York Daily Record. Hi, James. How are you today? Good, good Frank. How are you? Good, real good. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you about your offensive line. What is the next step, you think, in the development of that group from the end of last year uh, to now? What did you see in preseason camp that stood out to you about your line? Yeah, I think obviously it's, it's building confidence, you know, number one. I think going against our defensive line and our defensive ends every single day is something that we really embrace. The iron sharpens iron mentality, you know, going against Itor Gross Matos and going against Shaka Tony and Shane Simmons and, um, you know, Jason Owe and so on and so forth. I mean, we can list out a bunch of guys. We've got so many guys, you know, that are playing at such a high level, you know, at the defensive end position. Uh, Daniel Joseph as well. We're excited about Adisa Isaac. All those things are, are really valuable. Um, you know, I, I, I can't imagine we're going to see a better defensive end group in the country and then I think the other thing is the way our defense plays in practice how much blitz and pressure it's a fine line as a coach because um, you know you, you want to build that confidence uh, but you also want to be able to go against you know really challenging situations to force growth uh, but there's a fine line in that you know and I think that's that's kind of as the head coach you kind of balance what's going in per day from an installation standpoint on offense so our defense isn't seeing unbalanced and empty and all these non-traditional things you know early on in camp and the same thing that our offense isn't seeing uh, every blitz under the sun uh, when you're trying to install base so I think that's where we, we all got to work together on that but um, I think the biggest thing is is instilling offense uh, excuse me confidence in those guys uh, continue to build depth I do think we you know, have a little bit more depth than we've had in the past in terms of guys that we think are game ready. Um, you know, with our, I think we're going to have three guards that are going to play. Um, you know, probably more of a rotation than we've done in the past. Not, not that necessarily our philosophy has changed, but more we got three guys that we think that need to play, and then the same thing at tackle. You know, three tackles that we feel we feel good about as well that those guys will play, and then hopefully as the season goes on, you feel good about four guards and you feel good about four tackles and. And the same thing at the center position. So uh, hopefully getting Juice Scruggs back here soon uh, will, also, will also help with that depth and rotation. Joe Giuliano, Philadelphia Inquirer. Hey, James. How are you doing? Hey, Joe. How are you? Fine. Thank you. Um, regarding the running backs, uh, you talked in, uh, during camp about uh, four, um, Slade, Brown, Kane and Ford, and I just wondered if uh, there was a clear starter emerging from that pack, or will it be more of a running back by committee operation? Yeah, we'll have a clear starter in terms of the first guy that goes out. Ricky, Ricky has earned that, you know, for a lot of the same reasons I talked about at the quarterback position. But one of the things that we do as well, and I don't know if we've talked about this before, um, the last couple of years is, is, you know, part of our – you know, when we come out with depth charts and part of our, you know, when we come out with, um, you know, making decisions on who red shirts and who not, we have the players rank themselves, which is, I think, a really, you know, really good discussion and a really, you know, good way uh, to go about it is um, have, the, have the defensive line rank the defensive line. You know, how do they do it? Uh, have the receivers rank and the running backs do it? And I'd say more times than not, fairly consistently, the players see it the same way as the coaches. I wouldn't say individual players always see it the same as the coaches, but the group does. Um, and I think that's, that's been really valuable. So um, the running back room saw the running backs the same way we did, that, that all four you know, should play, but that Ricky Slade um, you know, would, would be the starter. Um, but, you know, we're going to rotate those guys. We plan on playing all four. And then obviously, you know, either by game, 
um, you know, or as the season goes on, you know, play play whoever we think is hot. You know, um, it could be based on matchups because we've got different styles. Obviously, Noah Kane's got a very different style than Ricky. Um, and there's some games where that may make sense or there's some situations where that may make sense, whether it's four minute or whatever it may be. So, um, you know, we'll look, we'll look at all those things. Mike Gross, Lancaster Newspapers. Good afternoon, James. Hey, Mike. Um, I had a different question in mind, but that really, what you just said about letting the players rank themselves is pretty interesting. Uh, how, do you, how do you do that? How do you, is, it a, is, is there a formal process or you just kind of informally talk to them? And, and, and does that manifest, does it actually show up on the depth chart what the players have to say? Yeah, so we actually have magnets in the room. Um, so, there's, so this started with Terry Smith. You know, Terry did this, and I found out, me and Terry got into a big discussion about it. It was something I thought was really valuable, you know, for the team as well. So we have magnets in there. So it's the coaches' ranking, and it's the, it's the players' rankings, and we do the players first. Um, but, yeah, each, each room sits there, and, you know, Pat Fryermuth ranks all the tight ends, and, and, and uh, Kuntz ranks all the tight ends, and Bowers ranks all the tight ends. And then, you know, obviously whoever gets the most first place, second place, third place, fourth place votes is how it comes out. Again, it's a, it's a really good discussion. I think it's a lot of times it's great information for the players because I think a lot of times when it's just the coaches doing it alone, uh, they will look at it and say, oh, well, you know, um, you know, be able to rationalize or, 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 or justify uh, whatever's going on. But when they're hearing it from their peers, and again, more times than not, it aligns with how the coaches see it, um, you know, there's value in it. So um, it started with Terry, something he did with his guys, which, you know, a lot of guys that maybe are a little bit further down the depth chart and they be, may be disgruntled. Um, it really creates a healthy discussion. And then it also allows maybe those guys um, to hold each other accountable in the room and say, no, this, this is why I got you ranked fourth, or this is why I got you ranked fifth. You're not doing these things the way you need to do them consistently. Um, and I think that, that feedback and that accountability, not just from the, the coaches to the players, but the players within each other, I think that's powerful. You know, I think that's, that's a really powerful thing. I think you, know, you, should want, you should want your teammates to hold you accountable. Uh, you should want the coaches to hold you accountable. That's the only way that you're going to truly grow. So, um, you know, I, I think it's been, it's been a nice little addition to what we're doing. And, you know, we got guys like Terry Smith. We got a, we got a fantastic staff. We really do. There's been some great discussions recently in our staff meetings at 7 a.m. Jared Parker, you know, I had an experience the other day that he shared. I had him share with the staff, which was really good for us all to sit in there and discuss for a while. And Tim Banks brings great perspective. Just got a really good staff like that. So, um, you know, when, when one assistant coach or one coordinator is doing something that I think is really valuable as the head coach I can kind of see it all and I hear it all and there's stuff that I'm going to steal from Terry Smith that Terry does real well that other guys may want to add you know to the way they manage their rooms or you know something I'll be sitting in the defensive installation meeting and something that Brent does with the entire defense that I think hey Rick this is something I think would be really good for the offense as well and vice versa um, it may be quotes whatever it may be uh, some some really good stuff going on. So a lot of times, what you don't want is there to be silos. You know where you got the the receivers coach doing it his way, or the offense doing it his way, or the quarterbacks doing it their ways. And as a head coach, I kind of break into all those silos and say, hey, these are things that we're doing really well, and here's some areas that I think we need to improve. And then. You know, we brought in a lot of different people from the outside as well. We got a lot, we've had a lot of NFL coaches with us this off season. We got NFL coaches with us right now currently. Um, you know, um, we 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 brought in educational specialists um, um, that we've gotten to know over the years from a couple different leadership summits and thing like things like that that sit in our our position meeting rooms and can talk about. You know, even just uh, you know, subtle changes in in our language that that are going to create uh, better learning environments. You know, for our players and for our team um, has been has been really valuable. So um, you know, we we've had a really good camp and a really good off season. Um, our chemistry and our culture is as good as it's been in a long time right now. So uh, I'm excited about it. Donnie Collins, Grand Times Tribune. Hi, James. How are you? Hey, Donnie. 
what, what kind of progress have you seen on, on special teams during camp with, with Coach Lorig running things for the first time? And are, is there any specific differences like coverage teams or kickoffs or anything like that that you're particularly happy with so far? Well, I, I think the biggest thing that, that, that I've seen is, you know, obviously when we hired Joe, um, you know, we did a we did an analytics study, you know, statistics on uh, the top special teams coordinators in the country, and, and his name just kept coming up, you know, and then it helped because I've known Joe for, you know, 15 plus years. We were roommates at Idaho State with Larry Lewis, so that helped. Uh, it also helped that his wife is a dairy farmer and that he loves fly fishing. And this, this area is pretty good for, for fly fishing, so that helped too. Um, but I think the other thing that really jumps out to me is he is a special teams coordinator. He lives it. He sleeps it. Some guys are special teams coordinators, but they would want to be defensive coordinators down the road. Some guys are special teams coordinators, but they want to be head coaches. Some guys, you know, th this is who he is. He lives it. He sleeps it. He eats it. Um, he is passionate about it. He's got a plan for it. Um, there is a there is a culture that has been created and established in our program now. Our players have bought into it. There's a lot of pride, um, you know, that we're taking in it. Um, you know, to be honest with you, the schemes there's some subtle differences, but but really, I think it's more just about uh, how we meet, how we manage it. We do some unique things with with how we how we how we meet. Um, and how we how we sell you know the CTG which is what he calls it change the game CTG um, culture that we have in our program and I think it's been really good I know the players are excited about it, the coaches are excited about it it also helps you know that uh, you know we're not relying on true freshmen we got an experienced punter we got an experienced kicker we got an experienced field goal kicker. Um, and we got some of the best return men in the country, uh, which is also part of it as well. You know, we got you know we got the guy running it, and we got the pieces uh, that we need to execute it as well. And then I think obviously our speed and athleticism on defense usually also helps to translate on offense as well as us trying to get more offensive players involved. We'll open to questions here in the room. Raise your hand, and we'll get a mic to you. Hey, Chris, what, one more thing. I, I I don't know if I've given you guys. Have I given you guys the green list of all the guys that are green lighted? You want that? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I see your head was shaking. That that was yeah. That was for Neil. Uh, so the guys that we're green lighting right now, again, these things could change. Guys can go from green to yellow or yellow to green, but just green lights from week one is Keaton Ellis, is Adisa Isaac, is Lance Dixon, is Brandon Smith. Is Caden Wallace, is Noah Kane, is Devin Ford, is Jaquan Brisker, is Jordan Stout, and, and Weston Carr, which it probably doesn't make sense for him really to be on that list, but uh, but but they're the green light guys. Hey James, how you doing? Good. How are you? Mark? I'm doing great. I'm wondering how you divvied up uh, first team reps at cornerback in the preseason, given that you have two guys who have played so much football, and then behind them. You have a lot of guys who are relatively young, and how did those young guys do when you put them in those pressure situations? Yeah, so I, I think early on, you know, we try to play, you know, the guys that we think are the returning starters as much as possible because I think you can fall into that trap of saying uh, these guys are ready, where they, they still they still got room for growth as well. Um, so we try to do that, but then kind of once we feel like um, you know they're in a good place, and also the unit. Because that communication between the corners and the safeties, that communication between the corner and the outside linebacker, those things that need to go on, and those guys need to get comfortable with each other, we got to build that chemistry of the unit. But then once we get to a good point, I think your, your, your point is a good one. We want to start cutting back the reps of the, the guys that we know who they are. They've shown it in games over a number of years. They've shown it in practice and in their preparation. And now we need to find out, you know, to your point, we need to find out Trent, Trent Gordon with an expanded role. You know, we need to find out about Keaton Ellis and Joey Porter with expanded roles. And really the other guys too, evaluating, you know, the Marquises and, and a bunch of those guys, you know, evaluate them too and see where they're at. That also determines whether they're a green or yellow or red. Um, so 
So, you know, we were able to do that, obviously, with John Reed, as experienced as he is, and with Castro Fields, as experienced as he is. It's really given us the opportunity to evaluate those other guys. We do think it's a position of strength for us. Uh, we felt like that, you know, after spring. We feel like that probably even more so, um, you know, after the, this summer camp. You know, I think, uh, you know, our, our recruiting class uh, last year was good. We got a bunch of long guys that, um, you know, that – you know, can run and can make plays on the ball. Um, I think whenever we can recruit guys, you've, I think you heard me say this before, you know, the DBs we recruit should should be high-level wideouts and vice versa. And I, I've seen that show up. So, you know, we're excited about it. Trent Gordon's also a guy that we think creates flexibility for us. He's a guy that we think could be a corner and also could be a safety. Uh, I think he's going to have a great career here, uh, very mature uh, very mature approach, very appreciative of his opportunity here. Um, so, you know, he's a guy that we think could do a lot of different things for us. And then obviously also, you know, um, you know, when we get into, you know, our nickel, our star, our star package stuff, obviously that, that magnifies also that third and fourth corner even more. James, for Lamont Wade, what are the biggest areas of growth and strength that he's shown to put himself in position to start? I think more than anything, Lamont is, is confident right now, and I think Lamont is comfortable right now. You know, he, is, he has paid his dues. He has overcome adversity. Um, you know, he's always kind of been a playmaker. Um, you know, we've been very pleased with how he's tackled you know, this, this training camp as well. I think him going up against KJ every single day at practice, I think has been really good for both of those guys. Um, you know, so I, I think it's, it's, you know, he's a year older. You know, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this last time as well. You know, the funny thing is a lot of times, you know, um, when these guys uh, transfer either to us or away, um, a lot of times, you know, guys that are coming, you know, uh, like Stout, for example, he's with us. He's doing great right now. Well, is it the new location or is it just that he's a year older and more mature? And, and I think that's, that's also a little bit, you know, with, with um, Lamont. I think, you know, um, the, the, um, the amount of pressure that he came into this program with um, in terms of how he was recruited and rankings and all those types of things and expectations, um, I think all that adversity and all those experiences really helped him grow. Um, at the time, you don't probably want to go through it. But I think looking back at us, we, all of us, you know, we know we're, we are who we are and uh, where we're at in life because of all those experiences. So I just think he's in a really good place. I think, you know, he knows the defense inside and out. Um, he's an experienced guy. He's a mature guy. Um, and I think he's excited and, and ready to take that next step. Coach? Hey, Coach. How difficult is the weight? from maybe the bowl game leading into your first game of a new season? And how do you keep your guys kind of level-headed? Yeah, I think it's fine. You know, um, for me, I, I don't mind it because I, I got the whole thing mapped out. And I know there's a lot of things that have to get covered. There's so many situations in football. You look at those games last weekend. You know, so many situations to get covered. Um, you know, and, and there's really not enough time in one week to cover all those situations. You know, whether it is, you know, the last play of the game when there's no time on the clock and you got to throw the pass and then toss it around with no one coming down with the ball, whatever your term is for that play that you don't get tackled with the ball in your hands, or whether it's the kickoff return like that at the end of the game from the Miami Duke game. There's just so many situations to get covered, wet ball, um, you know, all, all the things, four minute, two minute, overtime, you know, making sure you guys really understand all those situations. So for me, you know, it kind of, it's the right amount of time because we, we got to get all those things taught. We got to get all those things covered, uh, as well as our base offense and defense. And I think that's a mistake that I think a lot of young coordinators and young head coaches make is you, if you're not careful, you'll spend all your time working on those things that may or may never show up, you know, during the season. 
And, and you know, if you're investing too much time on them, those things, that you never get good at the things that you need to, your base, offense, defense, and special teams. So it's finding the balance of, of all of that. Um, but I do think we get to a point, you know, in training camp where, you know, they're getting grumpy and, you know, they're sick of going against each other and the defense knows our cadence and knows our checks and, you know, um, the offense has got a good feel of their tells on blitzes and you just say, okay, you know, we want to, we want to, we want to, you know, line up in Beaver Stadium and play. But we also try to change it up, you know, from practicing in the morning to practicing in the afternoon, practicing Beaver Stadium during the day, practicing Beaver Stadium at night, taking a break and going to the pool, you know, doing all these different things to, so it's not monotonous, if, if that makes sense. Uh, and I think, I think we've, we've found a pretty good balance of all that. Hey, James. How you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Um, I want to ask you, you mentioned these, a couple of these players a bit ago. Uh, at your star position, you got John Reed, Lamont Wade, Keaton Ellis. Those seem like three different types of players and three different you know, body types at that position. What went into the depth chart there, and are you looking for something specific from each of them? Yeah, you know, I, I get what you're saying, and, 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 and you're right from that standpoint. But really, in a lot of ways, the way they're played, you know, John Reed has played the nickel, so that's, that's part of that, the star. Um, Keaton is a guy that we would like to grow into that role, but also, you know, depending on how the depth chart completely plays out this week, who's going to go in to the corner spot when John Reed goes in, you know, uh, goes in uh, to the star position. And then Lamont, a lot of times when we're in our man coverage scheme and we rotate the safety down, Lamont is that guy that a lot of times is lining up over the slot receiver anyway. So it, it's very similar um, to what he does a lot anyway. So um, that's part of it. And then we also think Lamont's a good blitzer. So it's, it's more that than anything. Hi, James. Hey, Bob. I wanted to ask you a question about a Harrisburg High guy that's not named Micah Parsons. It's rare. But um, Damian Barber, mm -hmm. uh, he's on the second team, I think, at Nose. Could you just talk about his progress since he's got here and specifically maybe what you've seen from him this offseason? Yeah, so his, his development, you know, as a football player, um, you know, has been impressive. You look at the amount of weight that he's put on. Uh, learning a new position, gaining confidence in there, the size, the strength, the quickness. Um, he's had a really nice, you know, camp. He really has, um, you know, and has grown up in a lot of different ways. But, um, you know, I think, I think you're going to see him, you know, factor in. We're in a situation at defensive tackle that we probably haven't been in in a couple of years where, you know, you got Windsor and Barber and Hansard. It's a three deep that we feel good about with Shelton, Mustafer, and Culpepper. And I, th I think all six of those guys, you know, will play, you know, will play. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a pretty good situation to be in. You, know, you talk about everybody being 285 pounds or bigger uh, with three guys over 300 pounds. Um, and then the speed and athleticism, you know, that we have at, at defensive end. So it's a, it's a nice combination. Uh, but, yeah, we expect, we expect him to have a good year. Hey, Coach. Uh, can you talk about the challenge of the first game of the season and maybe equate it to last year where you guys got a, a real challenge out of uh, your first game? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think, you know, again, you look at those games last weekend, uh, they're unpredictable. And, you know, the, the – in college football, we don't have the preseason um, that, you know, a lot of those kinks get worked out. You're talking about younger players and things like that. Uh, and then you're talking about, you know, you know, depending on how your scheduling goes, whether it's the conference scheduling or your scheduling, um, you know, it, it can be interesting. You know, uh, App State was a team, obviously, that we had tremendous respect for coming in. And, you know, they had a history of, of, of playing this conference tough and big games and upsets and things like that. Uh, and then this year, you know, with Idaho. So, you know, for us, ultimately, it's about us, you know, and our program uh, and our preparation and our approach. But, you know, obviously you better have a really good feel of, of what your opponents do, their strengths, their tendencies, um, to be able to attack it. But, 
But, you know, really week in and week out, it's ultimately about us and playing up to our standard and how we do things. Um, and then, you know, making sure that we've done enough of what we just got done discussing in camp and covering all those situations, especially when it's magnified with a young team and a young quarterback. You know, I was watching that game the other night. You know, they got, a, they got a young quarterback playing, you know, his first game, national television, all those types of things. And, you know, whether it's turnovers or whether it's um, clock management or whether it's any of those types of things, they, they, they tend to show up in those first couple games, and uh, you want to make sure you've done enough to eliminate them. Hey, James. Hi, Neil. I was curious, uh, on the player assessment, uh, it's unique. Are they allowed to vote for themselves? Yeah, you know, I don't get into the specifics of, of like the rules of how they do it. Each each room kind of does it their own way. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, I think it, it kind of all evens out. But yeah, whether they vote for themselves or not, I don't get involved in that. Uh, Terry Smith probably does it different than Brent Pry. Um, I know in captains, uh, you know, we can they can vote for themselves as well. I don't think very many guys do, but yes. So can you clarify Cam Brown, and he has to sit out, but will he start in the second half, or has that been uh, figured out? Yeah, he, he won't play the first half, obviously, because he's been suspended for the, the targeting hit from last year. Um, so he's got he's to finish that out. But in terms of who starts the second half, we, we, hadn't, we haven't talked about that yet. Hey, James, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good. Uh, got Justin Shorter reflected as a first-teamer here at receiver. What did he do this offseason, particularly in camp, to, to make you comfortable in making that choice? And collectively, that receiver room uh, from when Parker got there to where they are now, what are the biggest advancements you've seen? Yeah, so with Justin, you know, he just – continues to get better you know we look at his college career which which he told me and his parents told me is very similar to his high school career you know he's a guy that you know just kept getting better and kept getting better um, you know he's had some you know in the past not recently but in the past has had some injuries that have that have affected his development and his opportunities uh, and slowed some of those things down uh, but I do think coach Parker's done a done a fantastic job uh, with that unit, very similar to how lorig has been on, on special teams. His confidence, his experience, um, his knowledge of fundamentals and techniques to give our guys the ability um, you know, to separate and route running, to be physical perimeter blockers, um, to understand the scheme and the big picture so it's not just memorizing routes, they're learning concepts, which I think is always the best way to teach. Um, but, I, you know, I think, you know, obviously, you know, as, as you guys know, that, that position last year, uh, as well as some other positions, uh, maybe didn't play as well as, as they would have liked. Um, you know, I think, I think those guys are going to have a very, very impressive year based on what Coach Parker's been able to do. But also just, again, those guys are older and more experienced. K.J. Hamler had a really good year last year. He's going to be better because of that. Jahan Dotson, the same thing. I actually believe the same thing about Shorter. You know, the injuries and the adversity he had to overcome last year, I think is going to help him. You know, Daniel George was able to, you know, gain some experience. I think, you know, you know we're in a situation again, you know, where we got a, a two deep at the very least and in some positions three deep, you know, with, with Cam Sullivan Brown, you know, that we feel really good about. You know, um, you know Dan Chasina. I think is a guy that's got a lot of buzz on our team right now, um, you know. And Mac Hippenhammer, you know, I would describe him as he's just a ball player. You know, he's the guy. He goes play baseball. Coach Cooper doesn't really know what to expect. Next thing you know, he's starting and playing well for them. Uh, you know, we lose him for for obviously all spring football for baseball. You know, Coach Parker's never worked with him. He doesn't know what to expect, and then he shows up, and he just he's just one of those guys. He understands spacing. He understands uh, he's got great body control. He's got tremendous ball skills. He's, he's just one of those guys. You know, I, I can't speak for baseball, but I think he's got a, a very bright future when it comes to football, you know. Um, so, you know, I think, I think you guys, I think everybody would be pleased with that group and, and excited to watch him play. 
Tyler took my question, but I got another one. Um, you mentioned the three offensive tackles, but Rashid Walker is the guy you guys are still expecting a lot out of. How did he fare during camp, and how do you think it's benefited him just because you've, you know, you've mentioned those ends as a strength so many times? Yeah, you know, I think um, you know, Rashid we knew was a very, very talented guy. Um, you know, you could make arguments that he may have been able to play, you know, last year for us. Um, but had a great off season. Um, he's much more confident. He's much more comfortable. Probably sounds crazy, but he's a skinny 324 pounds, very light feet. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that really, I would say, kind of remind me um, with Caden. Caden, I think, early on has shown a lot of things that Rasheed did, although Caden is, is a lot bigger at this stage. Um, but he's just he's a he's a big guy who's got light feet, who's got understanding about hand placement. He's got understanding about leverage. Um, I think he's 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 really reacted very well to Coach Lime Grover's coaching. Um, he's just one of these guys that really has kind of embraced the process process since he stepped on campus. So between him and Fries, we feel really good. You know about about our tackles, and then you know Des Holmes. You, know, you talk to our defensive linemen. You guys will have a chance to kind of interact with them. Ask them about Des. You know Des. You know Des is a big man. He's got light feet, and he probably has the heaviest hands um, of our offensive line. When 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 he punches you, you feel it. I mean, it's like two two bear claws coming at you. Um, he's a powerful guy, and, and we're excited about him as well. So Caden uh, Caden would be the next guy as well as Bryce Effner. Those two guys are going to factor in. Bryce, we think, is kind of a guard tackle swing guy. But, you know, we feel like we got, you know, three guys at both those positions, you know, that have bright futures. And we're going to need them. You know, we're going to need them. Uh, you know, Caden will factor in. Time for two more. We'll start with Ben. Uh, James, you just said a lot of good things about Keaton Ellis over the past couple months. So was this not necessarily a surprise that he had the summer like this? Were you kind of expecting him to work himself into that role? And what did you like about him so far? Yeah, I think it's just a combination. I mean, when you get a guy that's got his length and ball skills all the way back from high school, as a high school wide receiver, was was really good. Um, he's also smart and he's mature. You know, I think... You know, the, the other thing that I, I think, you know, kind of jumped out to us early on was his playmaking ability and confidence. Um, you know, and then obviously graduating early, it's, you know, that helped him. You know, that, that, that helped him. I don't think there's any doubt that extra time. But again, he's just got a combination of traits. He's long. He's fast. You know, he's quick. He's athletic. He's put on some good size. You look at him physically. You know, he looks strong enough. He looks like he's got a Big Ten body now. You know, um, and then and then, you know, I think you take all those things and and you put it put him in a situation where he's been able to get a bunch of reps uh, through spring ball, through summer camp, through summer skellies on their own and things like that. I just think, you know, he's, he's going to have a really good year for us and have a, a great career because he's just got so many characteristics that, that you're looking for. You know, um, but really, you know, that whole freshman class, we feel really good about. Hey, James, over here. Um, at right, at right guard, you named uh, C.J. Thorpe ahead of uh, Mike Miranda at starter. There, what went into that decision, and what have you seen from C.J. throughout uh, throughout camp? Yeah, I don't know if if we necessarily look at it that way because I think it says or on the depth chart. Yeah, it does. Yeah, so <laughs> it, I don't know if I would describe it the way you just did. Yeah, we look at we look at Mike, CJ, and Gonzalez as, as all starters, and those guys are all probably going to play an equal amount. Thank you very much, Coach. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. We'll be joined by Pat Fryermuth momentarily.